right? The point is, sometimes we are trained so well that we forgot about problem discovery altogether in our research and in our teaching. And that's what I want to talk about today. All right, let me start with this picture uh, uh, from, uh, by Gardner. I'm sure everybody saw this before, right? So from left to right, we have four types of analytics, from descriptive to diagnostic to uh, a predictive, and finally to prescriptive. Right? Now, if we look at this carefully, actually we could find that the NAV2, right, the descriptive and diagnostic analytics, are mainly data-driven problem discovery methodologies. Right? The right two are mostly model-driven problem solvers. Here's my question. What do you teach mostly? What do you teach mostly? The right two or the NAV2? Right? Not surprisingly, we are teaching mostly the right two, problem solving skills. Now, I think that is the issue here, right? Because in real life, nothing is well defined, right? So we train our students, give them tons of toolbox, but we forgot to tell them how to discover the problem in the first place, right? Oftentimes, in real life, uh, uh, defining the problem and discovering problem is more impactful and, and more challenging, actually, than problem solving. All right, I'm not the first person, actually, speak in this way. Let's look back a little bit, right? Uh, Albert Einstein, he said, if I have an hour, right, to solve a problem that my life depends on it, and I will spend the first 55 minutes on asking the right question, right? He said, for once I, I know the, the right question to ask, then I could solve the problem in less than five minutes. All right, he's a really smart guy. But let's look at somebody else, like uh, uh, Charles Catering, and he was the American inventor, engineer, businessman, and he was uh, the chief, uh, uh, he was in charge of the research of GM back about 100 years ago. And he said, a, a problem well defined or stated is a problem half solved. All right, somebody actually brings this a little bit further. Somebody is Steve Jobs. And once he said, if you define a problem correctly, you almost have the solution. I think that's what we should teach and also do research for. The point is clear, right? A suboptimal solution to the right problem is better than the optimal solution to the wrong problem. I think that's what we should tell our students first, and also in terms of our research. All right, so why is problem discovery so challenging? Okay, for one reason, that is data interpretation. Also, that, that is, also, is also the easiest way to impress our students, right? So essentially, looking at the data, tell students what that means, what the data means, right? Uh, uh, that's translating or transforming data into insights. That happens to be in Holmes' definition of analytics. Right? How many people is doing that, right? For example, now this may sound very intuitive, <coughs> but actually it's not, right? Seeing the same data, people might interpret it in very different ways. Right? This is a very simple example, right? What's that number? Well, it depends on where you stand, right? And what is this, right? Some people may say this is just a whole bunch of rocks, right? If you are color blinded, for example, right? But, but actually, some other people are seeing there's a face gazing at you, right? So the issue here is, do we really understand the data? Right? Let me ask you this question again. Do we really understand the data? Okay, now let me give a few examples. The first example is quite classic. It happened about 20 years ago between Compaq and Dell. I think this is also a case on this. Uh, Compaq was the market leader at the time in computer manufacturing with the largest market share, and Dell was the second in place in the market, right? The uh, a company also has health cash flows, uh, meeting patterns, uh, but all of a sudden, right, Compaq sold itself, completely abandoned its strong brand. That was the time when I was graduating, okay? I just could not understand what was going on, right? The market leader, right, with tons of technology, why it sold itself? There's no more compact anymore. Completely, all the, pan, all, all the names are all gone. Right, so, so I collect some data. I try to understand what was going on. And I will keep on reading those data for five years. 
Five years later, I suddenly understand what the data tell me. So today, let's, let's, let's give, a, give a try on this and say, I'm sure people here are all smarter than me. You will figure it out in just a split of a second of what's going on. I'm going to show that, that data to you, and you tell me what was going on. Just a little bit background before I get into the data. Uh, computer industry, right? It's, uh, they have the same technology, same suppliers, essentially. Right? The, the computer manufacturers are essentially assemblers by putting the common you know, standard components together right, with some you know, minor customizations, let's say. And they are competing on customer service and cost structure. And here's the data. You don't need much, okay, just this data is enough. All right, so collected from Yahoo Finance and uh, about okay, more than 20 years ago, what we find out is uh, Compaq, we look at gross margin, inventory versus sales, inventory dates, and finally operating cost over sales. Right, so, so you can see that Compaq clearly has an uh, advantage on the gross margin, right? 23% versus Dell, 20%. However, Dell was uh, uh, able to manage its operation much more efficiently. Right, inventory is only about 1.4% of the sales, which translates into days of inventory about five days. Right, and compact is about 20 days. And that actually uh, translates into a higher trading cost over sales. So compact is about 14% and deal is about 10%. So let's do the math, subtracting operating cost from the gross margin, right? What we find out is, is um, they'll outperform compact by about 1 to 1.5% in terms of operating margin. Now here's the question. Why is this 1% so critical that Compaq, the market leader, gave up itself? You guys know, all know about this, right? The Compaq, well, if you're at all, as well than me, so you wouldn't know the, the Compaq brand, it was so well known at the time. So what was going on? Why would Compaq sell itself? It's the market leader, right? It's just a bit, you know, one person less in terms of operating margin than Dell. Okay, this question actually bothers me for five years, but like, like I said before, right? Suddenly, I keep reading these, art, uh, these numbers, and uh, five years later, I figure out what was going on. Okay, in the interest of time, let me just give you my thoughts on this. Uh, if you want to understand why compact sell itself, you, first we notice the difference between the gross margin. How would you explain that gross margin? They are selling pretty much the same product, right? In the same market, right? Now, look at the difference between the gross margin, which is quite large. Now, if you have a different gross margin, there's probably only two reasons for that. The first is, the first is they get a better deal from suppliers, right? So your cost of goods, your cost of goods sold is lower than your competitors. And the second is you sell your product at a higher price. And there's only two possibilities out there, okay? Combination of these two. And, and like I said in the previous slide, they have the same supplier, don't they? S standard components, right? So actually what happened is they all had about 10 to 15% lower selling price than Compaq. Right, so here is the, uh, here is the ex explanation, right? So if you, if they all can sell it at a lower price, even with a lower price, it's making more profit. So how can Compaq compete? So the market is shifting, right? Because they all has a lower, pri uh, lower price, the, the product is more or less the same. So market is quickly shifting and uh, what would the compact do? Lower the price, and they all can do the same and still make more money. Right? This, just, this is a game without hope. Okay, this is a game without hope. But the good thing is compact management saw this, saw what is coming, they interpreted it, they understand what's, what's behind it, and they, sell, they sold the company when it's still worthy a lot of money, okay? They take a bag of money and went away. Now, who is taking over compact? HP, right? Well, so somebody said it, somebody did it. All right, now you may see this is a distant example. It happened about 20 years ago. So I want to show you a more recent example on the, along the same lines, right? Uh, well, uh, year 2020, 
Uh, one of the big news in semiconductor industry is, is TSMC, Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Corporation, was invited by the United States government to open new factories in the United States, in Arizona, actually. So this news immediately raised a question for me. That is, look at the picture, OK? Dongwei, meaning United States, have the best semiconductor manufacturing in this world, right? Now, the biggest one is Intel, right? Uh, TSMC is the second in, in size. And we have Qualcomm, we have Micron, we have Lavidi NVIDIA, we have AMD, and so on and so forth, uh, Texas Instruments. So the question is, why invite TSMC? It got to be very competitive, no? OK, let's look at the data. All right, so if you look at the data carefully, let me first tell you the conclusion. I find another compact versus Dell example. OK, I'm not saying Intel is another compact, OK? But I do find something similar. So you, I, did a, I did a simple value driver analysis. So essentially, I brought the semiconductor manufacturers from US, from Taiwan, from Korea, right, on the same map with x-axis being the gross margin and y-axis being the operating margin. Now, oftentimes, oftentimes, if you have a higher gross margin, you tend to have higher operating margin, right? Assuming operating cost is the same, right? OK, now, however, if you find a counterexample, you may find an amazing case. And here is the one, right? Look at, this is for three years, 2017 to 2019, right? Uh, Intel is over there, you can see that, right? INTC has uh, a gross margin in the neighborhood about 60%. Now, TSMC has a, a, a gross margin in the neighborhood about 50%, 10% less. But if you look at the operating margin, TSMC actually is higher. Now, for this industry, semiconductor industry, their suppliers are the uh, semiconductor material, semiconductor equipment. These are standard suppliers. They pretty much use the same, right? So to explain that what's happening here is, the, so, so the gross margin actually means TSMC is selling its product at a lower price. I think that's why Apple is using TSMC all the time, right? And uh, only recently. Uh, uh, but even with a lower price, TSMC is making more money. OK, again, I'm not saying Intel is not a compact. But what I'm saying is, is TSMC has a huge, uh, is, is operationally much more efficient than Intel. I can show you more, like cost breakdown a little bit later, if I have enough time. Uh, so the point is, the point is operating efficiency actually can be a huge advantage in competition. All right. Now I'm done with this semiconductor stuff. Let's, let's look at the second example about problem discovery, OK? My second example is the airlines, which is my favorite, uh, also the favorite of Warren Buffett. And what he said about airline is the worst sort of business right, is one that grows rapidly, right, requires significant capital to engender the growth, and then earns little or no money, right? Why did he say that? Let's look at the data, and you will see. Right? I'm sure everybody flew here, right? You know, actually, airline is an is a industry that's really, really hard to make money, OK? Now, in year 2015, let's look at the breakdown. Uh, the, the red graph, year 2015, if you look at a circle, that's the industry average profitability. That's the uh, industry average breakdown of their revenue. We find out the cost of goods sold is about 65% of the revenue. In that year, actually, that was actually a very good year. The, um, the net income is about 15% of the revenue. Just one year later, year 2016, the cost of goods sold rose to 70%. All right. Now, three years later, the cost of goods sold rose to 75%. And their margin, the industry average margin, net margin down to about 8%. Now, I haven't shown you what happened in year 2020 yet. You want to see? Year 2020. Anybody is flying year 2020? Nobody, right? 
Okay, year, year 2020 is, is, is bloody, okay? And you, you, you sure you, you wouldn't see that? Okay, you're not working for airlines. <laughs> That's fine. This is year 2020 data, and the cost of goods sold is 130% of the revenue on average. That's for United States. Right, now look at this, the tax, the orange part here is all negative. That means what? That means the government is subsidizing the industry, right? Even with that, the average loss of, the average net income is 40% of the revenue. Oh, I'm sorry, 49%. Okay, now that's the bad news. The good news is, is they're coming back, okay? They're coming back. Uh, all right. Now that's my airline industry, so we, we will talk a little, bit, a little bit more about this a little later. So you see the problem, right? The problem is the cost, is, the cost of goods sold is so high and, and rapidly increasing. That's the major problem. All right, my third example, these are just appetizers. Okay? That's my third example is the healthcare sector, which is the focal industry during the pandemic. Right? It was, now, there, there are two industry groups under this se major sector, right? We have uh, pharmaceutical, biotech, and life sciences. These are the drug makers. We also have the uh, healthcare equipment and services companies. These are the uh, uh, hospitals. These are the, these are the uh, uh, ventilator man uh, manufacturers and so on. So uh, and if you work for different industry groups, the cost structure and your life is completely different. Okay, however, What's in common is they all under heavy criticize from the public and the government about their outsourcing, okay? They outsource a lot of raw materials, right, to, to overseas. And thus, as a, as a result, it's, you know, they're subject to supply disruptions, uh, supply chain uh, disruptions. However, the industry is arguing, right, uh, 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 outsourcing can save cost of goods sold, right, can save money. Is that really so? That's the kind of data. Okay, so let's do a revenue breakdown, right, between these two uh, uh, industry groups, right? On the, on the left one, that is the uh, uh, healthcare equipment and services companies. And these are much bigger companies than, than the drug makers. Now, these companies are pretty much like a manufacturing company. Right, zero cost of goods sold is about 60% of the revenue. And with about 9% on sales general administrative, and finally it earns about three percentage of the net income. It's, it's like a traditional manufacturer, like an airplane, or it's like a, like a transporting company. Okay, now for these companies, if you outsource the raw materials, actually it could be very beneficial. Think about this, if you outsource uh, uh, raw materials, we reduce, that's it, we can reduce 10% of our cost goods sold, which is 6%, right, of the revenue. And that is also, that is already 200% of the, of the net income, right, which is great. Okay, now if you outsource, you reduce on cost of goods sold, but you may increase the, the sales general administrative cost, right, you need more people traveling, transportation, logistics, and inventory, so, so, but, even if you increase your, uh, 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 your, your sales general administrative cost by 10%, it's just 1% of the revenue, correct? So it is much beneficial. Now, if you look at pharmaceutical, uh, 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 biotech, and life science, I'm sorry, it's a little hard to read the numbers here, but I can read it for you. So the cost of goods sold is about 32%. The sales general administrative cost is 26% and they have the net income about 10%. Look at these numbers, right? Would you still outsource it? You reduce on um, cost of goods sold, but you increase on uh, sales general administrative cost, right? So you're in this case, I'm not, I'm not saying you should not outsource in this case, so you should do it much more carefully, right? Case by case to evaluate what is the net savings from outsourcing, right? with all the, also the risk of disruptions, right, into consideration. Now, if this doesn't convince you, let's drill deeper into this pharmaceutical biotech industry group to look at the difference between biotechnology and pharmaceuticals, right? 
Now, this is the number for pharmaceuticals, 31% for cost of goods sold, and 25% for sales general administrative cost. But if you look at uh, the biotechnology, sales, uh, uh, cost of goods sold is only 18%. And sales general administrative cost, allow me, 33%. And it's spent 45% of the, of the revenue on R&D. Okay, so would you outsource for biotech? Probably not, right? Th think about your savings and also your cost, right? Now this is just simple interpretation of the numbers, right? All right, so I just gave you some advertisers about uh, uh, the impact of problem discovery, right, in practice. Right, and along these lines, actually, we have developed uh, a lot of teaching modules and uh, practical lessons, right, for uh, solving and discovering problems uh, in supply chains, right, in different domains such as sourcing, make, uh, move, sell, and integration. Now, here, first, give you all night here. So, and we find descriptive and diagnostic analytics actually is much more receptive to students. Right, e either junior students or senior students because they all need to know why they want to study this before they actually study this. Right, they need to be well motivated as there's no other way than data to let them play around to give them more in incentives. Right, so we typically start with the competitive intelligence and benchmarking. Right, an example here is, which I I'm gonna show you a little bit later, is American Airlines. Right, this is actually the, the exercise that the most uh, uh, consulting company, many more consulting company will do, right, when they first get in touch with the client. Right, they want to discover, find out what is really the problem. Now the companies, although everybody knows they have a problem, their stock prices keep falling down, right? Their revenue is like only this, while the computer is making that. So they know they have a problem, but they just don't know what problem they have. And that's the first thing you do. Right? Do a benchmarking or competitive intelligence to find out the strengths and weakness. Oops. Now, uh, uh, from predictive and prescriptive analysis, we also did a uh, uh, teaching module on demand forecasting and production planning for pandemic influenza. Uh, everybody knows uh, recently, I think Moderna and Pfizer threw out millions of doses of vaccines, COVID-19, right? Now, don't blame them for, for planning because nobody can plan so well because demand is so uncertain, right? And, and, and also shelf life is so short. But that is actually not the biggest problem. The biggest problem is the, is the conflict of interest between the manufacturing companies and the government, right? Because the, the manufacturers, they cannot make a lot of money from vaccine. How much you pay? $50, right? So you know how much the cost is uh, versus the other drugs, they're making thousands, right? So, so typically, the manufacturers, the pharmaceutical manufacturers will play conservative in terms of production. They want to meet the minimum requirement. Overproduction just means they are going to source it away, right? However, the government will think exactly opposite, right? Let's assume the government's objective is, is to save life, well, which is a very strong assumption, okay? Not every government will do that. But let's assume that's the case. So the government will want the manufacturers to produce up to the most the maximum one, to cover the entire population, right? And that, and that, is the least, that, that is the conflict of interest, right? Which is the hardest problem to solve, actually, uh, uh, in this industry. That is what the case was, was looking at. Oops. So we also have sales and operations planning for coach logistics, so you can build a complete distribution model distribution logistic, uh, logistic network design model using Excel and solve it in one second. And okay, let's come back here. So uh, uh, we also did a, descript, a distribution analytics module actually based on Verizon wireless, the real life data actually help Verizon saved, it's a real case, uh, save $1 billion in inventory. They used to have two billion, now they only have one. Okay, inventory analytics, uh, we'll use the uh, uh, case of Amazon versus Macy's uh, to, to identify, to discover problems in inventory management, which I'm gonna talk about, uh, uh, talk about a little bit more later. Uh, and finally, sourcing analytics, right? 
uh, use the case of Apple global sourcing uh, for the CPUs. So here we'll, we'll talk, more, uh, talk more about uh, TSMC and Intel. Also develop games like Hunger Chain for supply shortages and rationing, and uh, a floor game for supply chain contracts and coordination. Okay, so I will spend a little bit more time on these three. Uh, any questions so far? Okay, please. want to teach your assessment along the supply chain while you're doing that? <coughs> I would like to know, I mean, why you're doing this. Okay. Uh, uh, it's about uh, you, you want to teach your students, I mean, how to do an assessment of a supply chain? Absolutely. Um, and you are, but all the combinations of all the steps of a supply chain, you are doing case studies? Uh, case studies based on data, yes. What for? What for? For them to, to be able to do their to first job. Huh? For them to be able to do their first job. So when students go to the real life, the, f the typical thing is they first have to understand, they need to so find their problems. Now the problem may not be some their manager tells them, hey, you have even the problem, go solve it. Most likely is, is the company says, I have a problem. Our stock price is falling down. Go find it and solve for me. Yeah, but that's a normal, a normal consulting approach. It's so not a common approach. It's a consulting approach. So you are, you are, you are teaching them how to, how to become good consultants. Why not? Just asking, because we <laughs> call okay. it supply chain analytics. That's why. Yes, a I want them to. consulting approach. Yes, absolutely. Okay, thank you. I want them to be able to discover the problem and solve it. Yeah. Okay, maybe I can better answer that question using a more concrete example, which is inventory analytics. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, actually, I'm always a consulting firm, so I really appreciate what you're doing here. I feel you know, a lot of times, exactly as you said, you know, we, uh, we jump to the problem solving too quickly without knowing what problem we are solving. A lot of times, as a consulting firm, you know, we are discovering what exactly the problems are. And uh, it's not an easy job. And also I'm interested, you know, you, you gave uh, some high level, I'm more interested in, into how do you identify, you know, it, the problem, because even the client come to you saying I have problem with inventory. It's not very clear. And also it may not be inventory at all. You know, it could be called inventory is showing as a symptom, but it could be upstream issues with production size, batch size, everything else, right? Mm -hmm. So. I'm more interested, you know, it, it's not easy. You know, you, you talk about the human intelligence, you know, going through the data, figuring out it itself. But you no, know, I'm wondering is there any effort in your uh, teaching experience, academia, or what you heard, any automatic way or like a, a data mining way to identify those kind of problems more easily? So instead of, you know, very ad hoc, you know, figuring out what the problems are. Great question. Let me talk about this. I can show you some tools okay. they can use to, to facilitate problem discovery. Okay, just in terms of come back to your question. I think here everybody is like, a, think about every, we are training doctors, right? We are helping companies to solve their problems, right? To, 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 to get more healthy. But just like doctors for, for patients, right? The first thing you do is to identify what is the real cause for that symptom, right? So, so. That's why I think that's what, should, what, what, what we should do. Okay, so let me just uh, talk about inventory analytics and analytics here. I want to compare the traditional way of teaching inventory management with what we call the inventory analytics, which is mainly about problem discovery. Okay, like I said, right, inventory analytics is not the same thing as we used to teach or learn about inventory management, which is all about modeling. And analytics here, in this case, will answer three questions. The first question is, for which industry is inventory important? The question is, you may, you may work for an industry like backing, they don't have any inventory at all. So forget about inventories, right? And second question is, right, even if inventory, you carry a lot of inventories, but how does inventory drive your company's financial performance? 
So you spend tons of time, you know, what kind of inventories, would that really have an impact on your water line? That's the question. And finally, right, let's say inventory is important for you, right, and inventory does drive companies' financial performance in your industry, but still, you gotta ask yourself, how do I know if I have an inventory problem? Have you ever asked yourself that question? Consultants do, right? Now, the point is, the point is, you may already manage your inventory at the optimum, right? So the room for further improvements can be very limited. Why work on inventories, right? So, but some, for some other companies, maybe you have huge room for improvement. And the question is, how do I know that? Right, so before I get into those models, I will first talk about this. Actually, I will spend most of the time on this. And the models, you know, they just listen to the recordings. All right, let me give some example. Okay, now to, to answer the first question, actually is country dependent, it's also time dependent, also industry dependent. So here I just give you an example, 2019 uh, United States. Right? I pick a few you know, industries uh, such as co uh, uh, capital goods like Boeing, right? uh, 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 automobiles and components such as Tesla, right? uh, consumer durables and apparel, you know that, right? Ocean machines, refrigerators, and clothes and stuff, right? And, and retailing, food stable retailing, uh, food beverage, tobacco, banks, software and services, and finally, semiconductor and the real estate. So let's look and look at them. If you look, if you look at other industries, go ahead. You can, you can easily pull out all the data, right? Now, that, this is only by United States. Okay, now let's first look at the medium, okay? Look at the medium. Uh, of course, there's tons of companies in each of these industries, so the, the, there's huge variation, right? Uh, inventory versus total assets. Now, but you can see that for banks, zero, nothing, there's no inventory. So, now, I happen to teach in Rutgers, which is very close to Wall Street. I used to teach a lot of news, news vendor models, and nobody's paying attention, right? Because they don't have any inventories. Now I know, I'm not, I, you know, I forget, I completely forget about it. Okay, now, now let's look at so software and services, 1% medium. So for them, it's probably not in interested, right? And for real estate, only also 1%. Now, so these are the industries, you don't want to talk about inventories eh, because the inventory is irrelevant. Now, but for some other industries, it's very, very important, right? Such as retailing, the median is 24%. So 24% of their assets is the inventory, which is quite large, right? So they really have to pay close attention to inventories. And, and what about else? Uh, uh, consumer durables and apparel. So these are the manufacturers for washing machines, refrigerators, and clothing. And on, uh, now the medium is 23% of their total assets inventory. Now, let's look at, each, look, look at the worst case, the 90th percentile. The 90th percentile for retailing is 44%. The 90th percentile for consumer durables and apparel uh, is 73%. So I would say actually uh, for consumer durable and apparel, the inventory problem is even more serious because their worst case could be very, very bad. Right, okay. Now, as I said, right, so for different countries over different times, the answer is different. So let's look at a different, com uh, different country. Let's look at China, for example. And you can look at Japan, you can look at the UK as well, right? So for China, there are similarities, also important differences. Now similarities would be, right, for banks, nothing, right? And for software and services, very little inventory still. Now also similarity is, if you look at consumer apparel and retailing, they also carry tons of inventories. But there's one difference down here, real estate. You still remember the number for United States? 1%, right? For China, 35%. So real estate companies in China, the median inventory over states is, is 35%. So what are these stuff? The apartments built but not sold, the apartment built in progress, the net and all that kind of stuff, right? In progress, from raw materials, finished goods, and so on, they got 35% of the assets, even though that's actually, I would say that's a national crisis. 
You can think about so many ghost towns, right? It's right there. And worst case, six, 68%. Okay, let's translate it into more understandable terms, right? So United States, right, the, the industries that you definitely want to talk about inventory is retailing, right? 24% of assets in inventory as medium, and that means 85 days of inventory. In China, that's real estate, right? And the medium is 35% of assets in inventory, that accounts for 1,374 days. Now, the similarity would be right, food stable retailing, they got tons of inventories. And, and the consumer durables and payroll, they got tons of inventories. All right. Now, let's look at, okay. Now, this graph also shows the, the trend over time. We notice that the median inventory days, right, the 1,300 uh, uh, days of inventory is not accidental, it's not just one year. It actually is consistent over time. Right? And if you look at the cash conversion cycle, it's about 1,000 days. 1,000 days. That's an, economic, that's an economical crisis. All right. Now you know uh, uh, which industry that, you know, in which in inventory is important. Right? And then that's to find out how does inventory drive financial performance? Right. Now, it depends on how you play with the data. Right. So what I did is I did a random driver analysis, try to correlate right, the sales, general administrative cost over, over total uh, revenue uh, uh, with, with inventory turnover for, for U.S. actual retailing, uh, S&P 500 companies. I found a strong correlation. So if you increase inventory returns, you reduce the, op the, the operating expenses. I guess TMCM I did very well in that, in that regard. Uh, and also you can find out a strong positive correlation uh, uh, between asset turnover and inventory turnover for, for uh, retailing, US retailing. Right? The point is you really have to data mine, right? mine the data, you, because for different industries, different countries, the curve could look completely different. You have to, you have to look, mine the data to find out the correlation between different KPIs. Okay, now finally let's say, suppose inventory, you got a lot of inventory, right? inventory also drive your uh, a company's performance in the industry, how do I know if I have an inventory problem? It's actually very simple, benchmarking, right? So here is, uh, uh, here is an example, right? If my revenue is half of yours, but I carry the same amount of inventory, then I must got an inventory problem. It's very simple, benchmarking. Compare, you know, companies in the same industry, when you see the variation, you know where to look. Let's say, for example, let me come back to this again. I'm sorry for the uh, small phones here. So if you look at retailing, let me just read the numbers. The median is 85%, right? The best case is 27%, uh, I'm sorry, 27 days. It's about one month of inventory. The worst case is 189 days. Now, if you're somewhere close to 189 days, you must have an inventory problem. But if you're close to, to 30 days, you probably don't, right? That's an easier case. Now, if you look at food stable retailing, so what is food stable retailing? These are the Walmart, Costco, they want to sell bread, milk, uh, uh, and you know, so this kind of food, right? And for them, if you look at numbers, the best case is about two weeks of inventory, right? The worst case is about two months of inventory. Now here's the question, where do you go shopping? Right, they are selling food. <laughs> if you want to eat fresh, where would you go, right? Uh, and finally, this, I find this is dramatic because I, I come from New Jersey, which is the, uh, which have, we have a lot of healthcare companies, uh, pharmaceutical companies, right? So if you look at pharmaceutical, uh, the best case is about uh, uh, 30 days of inventory Actually, I think they may, they may stock out, right? 30 days, it's, it's a little too short. But the worst case is 700 days of inventories. Right, you just look at this huge variation and, and locate yourself along this, this spectrum. You will know if you have an inventory problem or not. Let's be more critical on this. Uh, so let's just compare the rack all these companies, right? Let's say US retailing, 
right, uh, by their inventory dates, year 2018. Uh, you can do other years as well. And you find out Amazon actually is, 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 is the most efficient, right, has the shortest amount of inventories, which is about 30 days, or 27 days, right? And Macy's, 120 days, right, 120 days. And, and if you look at uh, uh, Nordstrom, right, and Tiffany, Tiffany is going about 500, nearly 600 days of inventories. But more variety than uh, Amazon. So, are we comparing uh, competitors or apples to apples, or because that the product variety may influence the inventory decisions? Yeah, that, that's a great question. Uh, if you look at product varieties, Amazon has the highest product variety than anybody else. And as as you have intuitive understanding, if you have a, a, a wider varieties, the inventory tends to high tends to be higher, right? So let's say. That's why Amazon is, I don't think Amazon needs to manage it. Well, it's keep, it needs to keep up its, its current performance, of course. But if there are any rooms for further improvements, doubt it. But for some other companies, they clearly have a lot of room for improvements. Did that answer your question? No, I was just saying that the, the product variety will also influence, uh, but, but in this case, it's very clear that uh, one would know that, imagine that Amazon has the highest amount of variety also. And in spite of that, if they have fewer inventory days, it's actually a good thing. But otherwise, uh, more often than not, the variety would influence or distort the inventory data because typically the more the variety, the more would be the inventory. Yes, yes, of course. So when you do actual comparison or benchmarking, you want to find out uh, your competitors as close in business models as yours. Right, so here, if you look at, if you're interested in Macy's, you might want to compare Macy's, right, versus Nordstrom because they are neighbors, they are very close, right? But still, if Nordstrom is much better than Macy's, right? So, so you're right, we should definitely take a closer look and try to make them, you know, as comparable as possible. Right. Amazon, as I know, they also, um, do like uh, what they call as, as well what the main the, the term of it basically they carry they don't carry inventory for their sellers somehow their seller carry the inventory uh, for Amazon seller so then when they ship it out then they, you know then they ship out directly from the seller's inventory to the consumer side at the end so there's no inventory hold for the whole process for Amazon so I think that probably is one of the reasons particularly in the recent years they do that a lot. So that's probably one of the reasons why Amazon's inventory is quite low compared to their revenue because mm -hmm. from their huge amount of the, the revenue has no inventory because it, it just, uh, you know, transparently going, uh, there's nothing holding mm -hmm. uh, at the Amazon side. So I think, but it's uh, still interesting to see the difference between Nordstrom and Macy's. Definitely see the difference because they have very similar business model. Right. Thank you for the comment. All right, so uh, here's about inventory analytics. <coughs> and next, I wanna talk about competitive intelligence and benchmarking. So inventory is just one part of the whole business, right? It's often not the most important ones. Right? There are many other considerations, operational-wise, right? So, so when you try to discover problems, you wanna look at the company as a whole, right? All aspects to identify the biggest problems. Right, so here is also what, I what we teach, right? So exactly, we try to teach our students to be a management consultant, management consultant uh, to discover problems and opportunities for the company as a whole right, in the first place. So the objective would be, right, we start with the industry analysis, right, to assess the industry potential and risk. So are you, are you, the question is, are you in a sunset industry or sunrise industry, right? So by using uh, a, a tool such as industry trend, competitive intensity, and value chain analysis. So what is value chain analysis? The question here is, I, I heard people often ask the question, 
what is the most valuable segment in your supply chain? Right? As a company, you have supply your customers, right? you have a whole supply chain from end to end. The question is, among these supply chains, which segment is most valuable? Depends on where you are, right? Which industry are you in? In semiconductor, probably semiconductor materials and equipment, <laughs> right? Uh, uh, for pharmaceuticals, I don't know. So you have to look at the whole chain, right? But the typical rule is the place where you have, have the least uh, uh, competition, you have the most value added. But it's worth it to find out. That's one of the questions. And then you do a competition positioning. So essentially, you plot out all the competitors in your, in, your, in your industry and find out where is your company okay, on that map. So you can clearly see where you are. And finally, enterprise diagnosis. Right, to discover problems and identify the causes. Right, so for example, you want to find out, compared to your competitors, what's your strengths and weakness? You want to do a breakdown analysis to, to find out the, the, each of the segments and finally do a value driver analysis to find out the causal relationships. Now, nothing better than an example, right? So that's the example. Uh, before that, uh, I just want to uh, say the, what the question would be answered here would be, let's see, what are the market potential, trend, and risk? What's the most valuable segment of my supply chain? So you might want to expand your business too. And where do I stand in the competitive landscape? And what's my strength and weakness, right, relative to my competitors? And what factors drive a company's financial performance in my industry? What's the most important neighbors, right, or enablers? And finally, what are my key problems and causes? Okay. So, uh, let me just look at an example, the American Airlines. Uh, if you look at, if you keep track of the transportation industry, right, you will see that American Airlines uh, from 2007 to 2020, actually, these, the, uh, these are the trend of the stock prices, right? And this is the best way to find out if your company has a problem or not, or in crisis or not. You see, they all started out the same, okay, percentage-wise. And then after about 12 years, uh, all the competitors like um, Southwest, the, the stock prices grew about 280%, Delta 200, 233%, United 157%, even the S&P 500 index grew 127%. But American Airlines, negative 41%. That already tells you the company is in trouble. Okay? The investors, the investors, the smartest people, right? So the problem is, what is the problem, right? Everybody knows there's a problem. <laughs> so what exactly is going on, right? All right. So the first thing is you want to find out where, which, which industry, right, is your company. Let's say your, your company's classification. So because you can find out your competitors, of course, there are all kinds of different ways of classifying industry or companies, right? This is actually by uh, a standard poor, they call the, uh, global industry classification system, right? So you find out American Airlines actually is one of the airlines, right? That's fine. And then <coughs> this is the industry analysis. Actually, this picture has a lot of story on it. it because it expands to 2015 to 2021, right? Just over the pandemic. And you see that the red, the red curve shows the airlines. The first one is the total, the gross margins. Airlines has, has high margins than air freight, okay, about twice as much. Because people go there, have, have to come back, right? But, you know, goods only go one way, right? So, uh, so airlines is typically more profitable than air freight, but not during pandemic. The pandemic, the airlines, the gross margin is negative 20%, that's the median. So the, air, the airline industry suffers significantly from the pandemic. But it's coming back, okay, it's coming back. I mean, after one year. Uh, so, <clears throat> and if you look at the gross margin, the airport actually has the highest gross margin. Interesting, right? The airport has the highest gross margin. 
But now, if you go down, if you, uh, also the airport suffers hugely, right, during the pandemic, but it's coming back actually higher, right, the green line. So is the air, does the airline have a future? Yes, you do, right, but not under pandemic. Now, let's do a value chain. As, I, I know I, I got put, put too many stuff on this. So I just want to show you, right, uh, as an example, what is the most valuable segment on the airline supply chain, right? So these are airlines, uh, the rightmost airlines, and top, that's the air, airspace and defense. So these are the airplane manufacturers like Boeing, right? And we also have the airport services. We have the coal and fuel. We have the oil and gas, right? So so you can map out the end-to-end -end supply chain, and on each of the segments, you can you can you can plot out uh, uh, the medium, let's say net margin, and we'll find out actually uh, airport services this year 2021 data. Uh, airport services is actually very profitable. It's probably one of the most profitable segments on this supply chain. You know why? Because in one city, most likely it's only one airport. Of course, New York has three. Some other city has multiple. But in most of them, there's no competition. Very simple, right? But would the airlines you know, uh, uh, expand their operations to manage the airports? I doubt about it, right? So anyway, but it's interesting to find out. And you'll find out uh, on the right, you have the major, world's major airlines, right? such as the, the, the US three, right? American, Delta, and, uh, and United. Okay, these are all about industry analysis. We understand the, the most valuable segments on the supply chain, the industry trend, and so on. Now let's look at competition uh, positioning. The question is, where are you on your competitive landscape? Right, so <clears throat> one way to do that is to plot um, total cost versus operating margin, operating income. Right, look at this. These are the top three US airlines, right? Delta, United, America, right? And in the middle, LUV, and that's Southwest. Okay, this is Southwest. And you can see that Southwest spent about 50% of American airlines and almost made the same operating income. So if there's any airlines in, 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 in United States that are worth investing, that's probably the Southwest. Right? It is so efficient, right, to convert the cost into profits. Go ahead. Right, Delta is also very good. <laughs> yeah, right. Delta is also very good. It's also worthy, worthy of investing, but not American. Uh, right. Okay, now these are about profitability, right? So we can also look at uh, return versus risk. So the x-axis is liability versus total, uh, liability asset ratio, and the y-axis is return assets. And American Airlines is over here, it's already about 100%. That was in 2019, okay, that's before pandemic. And this is Alaska, and here are the, the two others, Delta and United, they're somewhere in the middle, right? So that means, they don't have so much debts, and their profitability is higher. And of course, nobody can beat up Southwest, right? It has the highest return on assets. Meanwhile, the, the smallest, uh, almost the smallest uh, liability asset ratio. Now, the red dots are the Chinese airlines. I put here just to compare. So in general, the Chinese airlines are much less, uh, has less liability, but also has much lower return on assets. Well, that's state-owned companies. So when you talk about liabilities, that's, that doesn't mean anything, right? Okay, now, uh, so one last thing I want to say is, now let's look at value driver analysis, right? So I, I tried, I did a lot of data mining in this, in this case. I, I pulled out the, the internet data. I tried to find correlations, right, between their performance and their, their uh, control variables, such as liability. I find out there is a strong negative correlation between the return on assets versus liability as ratio. So which means if they have a lot of debts, it tends to earn less. Now, it's, air nice is an is a asset heavy industry, 
you gotta have the, the equipment to do the business, right? And that you have to pay a lot of interest, you have to pay a lot of cost on that. So if you are heavier in seats, it turns to make less money. Right? Also means if you do not utilize your assets more efficiently. Okay, now, uh, so one, uh, a few last slides. So here is a breakdown analysis. I, I break down the revenue. I try and find out, right, which airlines worthy of investing. So instead of looking at the total numbers, I, I look at their, their segments, right? So as I showed before, uh, the year 2019, before pandemic, the total, uh, the cost of goods sold is about 75% of the revenue, which is, which is very bad, right? But if you look at a different airlines, actually they make different net margin, even with the same amount of cost of goods sold, okay? So let's say we have Delta and Southwest, right? With, you know, very high cost of, uh, uh, cost of goods sold, they still make about 10% of the net margin in different ways, right? So now for Delta, they have lower other costs, right? If you look at this, they have the cost of goods sold is very high, but the other cost is lower, which I will explain on this next slide. But for uh, Southwest, they have lower cost of goods sold. And if you look at uh, uh, closely, uh, Southwest, their operating expenses, SNG, uh, uh, SGNA, is negligible, right? It's almost zero, right? Unbelievable. Now, American has both high cost of goods sold, also high other costs. That's why it's only make about one to three percent of net margin. Right, so even with this industry, everybody has very high cost of goods sold, but some company can still make a lot of money. Right, and that's the point, in different ways. If you don't break down, you will never see that. And finally, then let me explain about the other cost, right? The other cost come from the government subsidies, come from interest, rate, interest payments, right? Every other cost, you know, other than oper operating cost and cost of goods sold. Right? The reason Delta has lower other cost is because look at Delta. There, the, the yellow part is the uh, property plant and equipment, that the aircrafts, right? It has much lower assets than the other airlines, right? While the Southwest, actually has a lot of equipment cost. So there's no savings on, on, on equipment and interest, but they can only work on operating cost, right? And, and cost of goods sold, right? But American airlines, American airlines had, had a lot of assets, right? Also has a very high cost of goods sold. That's why it's in the worst position. Okay, let me summarize. Uh, in terms of American Airlines, uh, American Airlines is the largest airline in the world, right? It looks like a lion, but actually it's a small cat. Uh, in the sense that it's largest in size, but the almost weakest in profitability, growth, and financial health. Now, the key problem is, right, of course, the, the, the stock price is tell, actually told you the truth. It just tells you what was going on, right? <laughs> okay. What was going on is, is American Airlines needs to reduce liabilities, their assets, too much assets. And they didn't fully utilize those assets. Plus, their cost of goods sold is also too high. That's the problem, right? Okay, maybe how much time, how much more time do I have? Okay. Okay, uh, any questions? Discussions? Any questions from the audience? I should have a quick question. I mean, are you done or? Oh, I'm not done. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. Uh, all right. So, but this is going to take a lot of time. So maybe it's better to take questions now. Just, just a quick one. Earlier yeah. when you were sharing, the, there was a graph showing return uh, versus a liability. I saw an airline called CCHK. What is that one? Because I think it's uh, yeah. This? Uh, right. So on, on the y-axis. You mean this one? SDHK? Uh, CCHK. Is it CCHK? Uh, on the y-axis. 
on the y x y okay oh c q h k oh c q h c q h k what what, what error is this <sighs> because it's a, the position is quite <laughs> quite yeah, it's strange. interesting there's CQHK. no liability for this error yeah let me see which one is this c q h k right here q and h k Yeah, some airlines in Hong Kong. Oh, oh you have no data on this? Okay. But uh, anyway, I, I guess it's not That's an okay. urgent question. We, we can maybe carry on and then we can find out later. It's yeah, it's got to be a company in Hong Kong. It's just that the position on the graph is uh, kind of special. Okay, Q or HK. It's Hong Kong airline, something Hong Kong airline. Sorry, can I easily find it? Uh, it? It's okay. I, I guess okay. Uh, you can finish up what you still have to say. It's still okay. <laughs> so my one last example is about uh, sourcing analytics. How many people teach sourcing? <sighs> well, I'm sure you all, all you spend a lot of money, right? Sourcing analytics is all about find out where you spend. Right. Would you be able to save more from them? Like, did you really get the value from it? Right. Now, you can do the same analysis on our personal or family spendings or on a company spendings. The company spending is just much bigger, not larger scale. Okay, but it's the same logic. Okay? And so if you're working in sourcing, lots of tons of people working in sourcing, especially after pandemic. Okay? Um, now, if you're working in sourcing, there are typically four areas to, to, to work for. First is sourcing intelligence. What is that? It's really identifying and selecting new suppliers. Why do, you do I, why do we have to do that you know, all the time? That's because the suppliers' landscape is always changing, right? Uh, new suppliers, new products, right? Corporate changes like merger, acquisition, bankruptcy, you know, all, kind, all that kind of things going on. So, so companies have to frequently adjust their supply base. So Apple is negotiating contract with TSA every year, right? So you can see it's changing a lot. Okay, so you have to do this exercise at least once a year for large corporations. Now supplier management, okay. The other thing is, I'm sorry, you know, too fast. And the second thing is spend analysis and strategic sourcing. So what is that? It's all about designing your supply base. Why is that so important? That's because you have to balance the cost versus the risk. Right, think about this. Diversification, and that means one product you have multiple suppliers will help you reduce the risk. But it's gonna increase the cost, no? Because you, you, everybody gets smaller portion, right, of the supply. So, but the risk is less. Now, it's consolidation, the other way around, will reduce the cost by increase the risk. The question is, how, to, how, how do we balance, right? For every category you, you purchase, you have to do this exercise. Now, about uh, uh, supplier management, right? And it's about rationalize and manage existing suppliers. Right, keep track of the performance, right? Make sure they are they are they are complying with the contracts, which takes a lot of energy. You you got to have a you know a sophisticated information system to do this. Otherwise, nobody can do that. And the, the point is, you got millions of dollars spent, right? From hundreds or thousands of SKUs and, and thousands of suppliers. Yeah, how to keep track of their performance? Right, critical question. Finally, buyer uh, uh, management, the buying process. You probably don't have one buyer in your company to, to make all the purchases, right? You have a team of purchases. So how do we manage them? <coughs> right, so, and you know what? This is extremely data intensive, okay? Extremely data intensive. Look at your critical build. You figure out all the purchases, okay? That's a lot of data, right? It's all about, it's sourcing. For me, it's all about data analytics. All right, here I just want to show you a, one example of using data analytics to identify and select the right suppliers. An example I want to use is Apple sourcing CPU. So here I want to uh, focus on sourcing intelligence, which is selecting, identifying new suppliers. Right here are three things you, you will do. The first is market intelligence. What is that? It's essentially identify where are the, mark, where are the suppliers, right, from, from which country. Right, what they're offering, right? Let's find out what, about the supply market, the competition. Is it a monopolized market or a competitive market? Right, competitive market is the best because you know you have alternatives, right? And 
and you want to find out market trend and stability. If the market is very unstable, like like flash drive, uh, flash memory, actually, you got to secure a supplier because otherwise next year you may not have enough supply, right? So there's a lot of things to consider, and you have the supplier. Uh, I'm sorry, the the bargain power analysis. So you un you want to understand and quantify your leverage versus your supplier's leverage. Who has the bargain power? Uh, and, and I don't have time to get into this because it's a little bit involved. But if you're interested, I can send you all the slides. And finally, after you identify the potential suppliers, you gotta compare them, right? Side by side and find and figure out who is the right one. Now, just in the interest of time, let me just skip something here. Um, so the example I'm, I'm gonna use is I iPhone's global supply chain. Right? iPhone was extremely successful. Extremely successful. Okay. Now, one of the reasons for its success is its global supply chain. It could reduce the cost so low. It makes so much money out of that. And the suppliers were technology, te uh, technically ex extremely capable, right? And, and so to, to, come to, 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 uh, to put together such a, such a great supply base takes a lot of efforts and, and data as well, right? So uh, what I want to say is the, the original iPhone completely outsourced manufacturing. Nothing is produced by Apple, right? The major suppliers are Samsung and the Inferno and the Intel and so on and so forth. And it turns out, it turns out, soon uh, uh, Samsung become a competitor, right? Come up with a similar phone, but a lower, with a lower price. Actually captured a bigger portion of the, of the global market. Okay, that means what? That means you cannot continue <laughs> sourcing from Samsung anymore, right? Because, you know, this guy is gonna take all your ideas and, and you know, yeah, create his own products. So, so, so that's why uh, Apple was facing a huge decision of uh, sourcing, right? Semiconductors, right? CPUs, who to source from, right? So the question is how to continue success, right? So the first thing you do is try to figure out what's your sourcing criteria? How do we select suppliers, right? Supplier uh, selection criteria. Now, to do that, you gotta understand yourself first, assessing your needs and match your needs, right? Match your needs with, with the uh, selection criteria. So let me just keep it short. So the need of Apple <coughs> is still cost, okay? Of course, technology, but also cost. So if you look carefully, uh, uh, compare, let's say, all the IT firms, S&P 500, 500 IT firms together, you find out Apple needs way above everybody else in terms of total revenue, but not profit, okay? It make a lot of revenue, but not profit. This is the uh, uh, profit frontier, that means in each category, right, the, the, the envelope shows the, the companies that has the highest profit margin, right? Now, that's profit margin. If you look at absolute value in terms of total profits, well, Microsoft is not so well known these days, but actually it made most money, right? Its revenue is only half of Apple, but it make more profit than Apple, right? Google is right here. Where is IBM? Over here. Where, where is HP? Over here. And here's Facebook. These are the cash cows. Okay, anyway, so let's break it down and find out what's going on. Okay, we have three companies here for technology uh, 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 hardware. This is Apple, right, 61%, which is better than the industry average, which is 66%. So Apple is, is doing fantastic, okay, in terms of supply chains of uh, cost of goods sold, uh, but still, still cost is still the biggest portion of the revenue, okay? So you cannot talk about procurement without talking about cost, right? And here, HP, 81%. Is this still a technology company? Doubt it. And if you look at Dell, Dell is pretty good in terms of cost, cost of goods sold, but its sales general administrative cost is 20%. Unbelievable. I don't know why they spend so much money on sales. Uh, maybe they pay their exactly too much money? Okay, anyway. Okay, am, am I out of time? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so let me just talk uh, selection criteria, which, which I will end here. So for technology company, 
supply, the, the supplier solution career will have at least three components. The first is capability. It's technical capability, innovation, right? Also manufacturing capability. It's got enough factories to be able to produce you enough chips, right? So you can sell. That's the first criteria. The second would be cost, right? Pricing versus profitability. So the ideal supplier would be somebody who can offer you a lower price, but also the supplier can make a lot of money. You know why? Because only that the manufacturer, the supplier can keep on, keep on supplying you without going bankrupt in the middle, right? You got thinking that way. So the supplier needs to offer you a good price and also make a lot of money. This is conflicting objective. Now, the reason I want to bring this up is because TSMC is the best of doing this. They can offer you a good price and still they make tons of money. All right, now you also want to have bargaining power. You, have you want to have leverage over your supplier. And finally, your supplier needs to be financially healthy. They are not bankrupt in the, in the near future. And, and they're also flexible and, and responsive, meaning operational-wise, they're very efficient. They can quick, if you have a demand surge, they can actually meet you up. And finally, one last word. The supplier should not be like Samsung. They should not leak the, the sensitive information and, and also become a competitor in the future. Thank you very much, Yao, for a very interesting and insightful talk. Um, so I guess we can take maybe one or two questions from the audience if you have any questions. Um, if not, uh, just a quick one. Yeah. Um, um, I, uh, I am actually amazed uh, by how you use all the graphs to show the students how to identify the problems. Mm. Um, but uh, uh, how can you elaborate a little bit on how you uh, draw these graphs? So I guess from a student's perspective, right, they, how do they come up with these graphs so that they can analyze it? Okay, so that comes to the key point. Now without this data, without, uh, handle, without these easy tools, you won't be able to do this. Right, so that's why we have a website, which is right there. All the data is there, uh, sdata.ai. Uh, SDA so if you go to that website, uh, all the data is there. So you don't have the clean data. Now, Typically, clean data actually take 95% of the time, right? So what we want to do is, so you, you, so the data is all cleaned up, right? Go to that website, and it's, it's completely free. It's for teaching purpose. So, so and, and there's a toolbox. You can choose any of the tools, like what do I say here, radio drive analysis, breakdowns, or, or geographic information, and so on. You can, you can a, a few clicks, you get, you get whatever you want. The point is, you got to know which direction you want to go. As long as you know that, then in a few minutes, you'll get everything out. So it's like, uh, what? It's like uh, Tableau, but Tableau has no data. You have to clean data. But it's like a Tableau plus data, that's it. That's great resources to know, yeah. Thank you, thank you very much. Yeah. So uh, thanks uh, everyone for attending the session. Let's uh, thank uh, Professor uh, Yao Zhao.